Hi, my name is Andy Boyle and welcome to The Primer. This is a video how-to series on the Forensic Technology product line and some tips and tricks on how I think you can best use them to get the most efficient use out of them. So here we go with the unfired cartridge. There have been many different designs of cartridges throughout the years, but the two that have really stood the test of time and that are commonly encountered nowadays and the ones that we cover with IBIS are the uh, center fire type. And that's where the primer is located in the center of the head of the cartridge case. And there's the rim fire type where the primer is actually 360 degrees around that perimeter inside the rim of the cartridge case. We take a closer look at the center fire. Uh, we'll see that there are four main components here to a center fire cartridge. There's the cartridge case, there's the bullet, Inside, you've got the propellant, and at the rear, you've got the primer. Also, uh, different parts, uh, naming them, you've got the head of the cartridge is where the primer side. This is a top view of the head right over here. On the opposite end, you've got the mouth. That's where the bullet is actually inserted. You've got a cantilever on this bullet. Uh, that's not always there, but this particular one does have it. And this cantilever here is a band going all the way around the bullet circumference which is there to give the uh, mouth of the cartridge case a little bit more grip when it's crimped around it at the factory when the ammunition is being made. At the back you've got the extractor groove. Uh, this is a groove around the base where uh, it facilitates the extractor which is almost like a claw or a hook that's part of the firearm that's going to grip onto the back of the cartridge case and that groove is there to give it a little bit more purchase when it grabs on. If we talk about rim fires, you've got the same four components here, the cartridge case, the bullet, the propellant on the inside, but then you'll see the primer is a little different. The primer is actually inside, and just like we saw earlier, it is all the way around. It's 306 degrees around that inside of the rim. And you've got the cartridge head at the back, mouth at the front, just like before. Here you've got a cantilever on the side. The well, first one is knurled, the second cantilever here is smooth, and it is filled with a lubricant. The reason why you have these on the lead bullet, uh, they help break up the bearing surface. The bearing surface is the part of the bullet that is going to have contact with the barrel. And lead is a very soft metal that, uh, as it goes down the barrel, it kind of smears along. It uh, It is a, a dirty metal to work with, essentially. And... Ultimately, as it goes down that barrel, it's going to leave a residue. And so having those cantilevers there, they break up the bearing surface, give it a little less friction to make it slide easier. And even introducing lubricant as well helps it slide that much better also. And at that tail, you've got the rim as well. Of course, that's where the primer is. There's your rim. Now, if we talk about rims, there are different types that you're going to see on different types of cartridges. A rimmed cartridge, just like that rim fire, is a cartridge that has a rim that flares out wider than the diameter of the body of the cartridge case. So the diameter of the rim is wider than the body of the diameter of the cartridge case. Semi-rimmed is similar. It's wider at the, at the rim, but also you've got an extractor groove. A rimless cartridge simply has a rim diameter that's equal to the diameter of the cartridge body. And a belted one has a reinforced band towards the back of the cartridge case here. And the reason why that's there is that this is going to be a very high pressure round, uh, rifle round. And because of the pressures that are introduced, if we look inside this guy, the part of the cartridge case here where the wall comes down and meets to the base, this corner is called the web. And when you have extremely high pressures, that web is a high stress spot that can tear apart inside. And so a belted cartridge has that reinforced band there to just make sure that web is reinforced and stronger. Lastly, you've got a rebated rim here, and you'd come across this. The rim diameter is actually narrower than the body of the cartridge case. You'll see this when a cartridge was designed uh, to reuse an existing part, a gun part that was already out there. What that means is that when you have a caliber like this, the Diameter of the body and the bullet that's going to fire require a new barrel, a new chamber, usually one piece. But when it comes time for the rim where the bolt of the firearm is going to interact, rather than design a brand new bolt, 
you can reuse an existing one if you just make the diameter of that rim equal to an existing caliber. So that's what they did. They made it much bigger in the front, but then they tapered it down smaller at the back so that they could reuse a bolt face that already exists. To understand cartridge names, uh, two big things to keep in mind is that there are no rules to how you name a cartridge. And if you're the one who invented it, you can call it what you like. So you factor that in around the world, you've got different people at different times that were coming up with different ideas. And at times you can see that there are trends that were followed, but overall, uh, car naming cartridges can be a pretty wild thing. The first portion of the cartridge name generally refers to the bullet's diameter, but that does not necessarily represent its true diameter. And what I mean by that is a caliber, a common caliber, like 38 Special here, the proper name of that caliber is 38 Special, just like you see it here. There's no decimal point, you'll notice. 38 Special is the name of that caliber, but the bullet diameter is actually 0.357 of an inch. Uh, that's essentially point 36 specials, but they could have called it, but they did not. It's 38 special is the proper name. But the fact that they didn't, that you do not include the decimal point there in the caliber name is a rule that should be followed. Uh, the decimal point is there for the true diameter, but when you're using a name, uh, it does not need to be included for the uh, imperial measurement. The inches calibers uh, don't have to have that one. Second portion of the name could refer to any number of things, which include the following. Uh, you could have the designer's name, which is a person or company. 308 Winchester is an example of that. Winchester Company designed the cartridge. It might also refer to the cartridge case length. So you have a caliber name like this is typically uh, from a military caliber. Uh, the first portion is the bullet diameter, 7.62 times the cartridge case length, 39 millimeters. Year location of introduction, so it, you could have 30 odd six Springfield, 30 caliber bullet introduced in 1906 at the Army's Springfield Armory. Could also refer to the powder charge. This was common back in the 18, well, mid 1800s. Uh, 4440 Winchester was a 44 caliber bullet with 40 grains of black powder made by Winchester. Or it could just be something that the designer thought sounded cool. An example of that could be 577 Tyrannosaur. That's a cool sounding caliber. Uh, and that was just what they wanted to call it. Cartridges can be known by different caliber names around uh, the world, depending on where you are. And an example of that could be 9mm Parabellum here. That was what it was originally called as it was designed by the Germans around the 1890s or so. Uh, in, during World War I, it was commonly encountered in the Luger pistol, and the Americans just nicknamed it 9mm Luger, and over time that name stuck. And the military version of this, it is still a military caliber, and it has a military standard naming. Uh, 9x19 is 9mm bullet, 19mm length cartridge case. These are all synonyms for talking about the exact same caliber. And one last thing is if you see Magnum as part of the name, 44 Magnum or 357 Magnum, Magnum as part of the title of the caliber is going to let you know that there's going to be a lot of pressure to this one. Expect a lot of recoil. This one's going to kick a bit. Common cartridge synonyms. Well, these are some popular examples of cartridges that have uh, many, uh, multiple names. And depending on where you are in the world, one might be more commonly encountered than, that, than another. Uh, 25 Automatic Colt Pistol is the full proper name of this caliber, but it's been shortened down to 25 ACP, 25 Auto, and in Europe, uh, with the metric system, you'd see this stamp on the side of the gun, 6.35 by 17 millimeters. 32 Automatic Colt Pistol goes through the similar naming process, 32 ACP, 32 Auto, 7.65 by 17 millimeters. 380 Auto's got a bit more names to it. Uh, 380 Automatic Colt Pistol, 380 ACP, 380 Auto, 9x17, 9mm Browning, and then 9mm Short or 9mm Kurs is short in German. 9mm Corto is short in Italian and Spanish. And 9mm Browning Cool is French for short also. So you've got uh, this caliber known in different countries by different names, but again, these are all talking about the exact same caliber. 45 automatic Colt pistol, 45 ACP, 45 auto, 11.25 by 23, 9mm Makarov, 9 Mac, 9 by 18 millimeter. 
we saw this nine millimeter parabellum before nine luger nine by 19 could even be called nine millimeter nato 40 smith and wesson 40 s and w 40 auto 10 by 22 millimeter 10 millimeter auto uh, automatic sorry 10 millimeter auto uh, 10 by 25. there's a lot of these to remember but what you're going to find is that you're going to become accustomed to the same ones that you see in your region. Wherever you are in the world doing your work on the IBIS machine, what you're probably going to notice is that after a while, you're really seeing probably about the same eight calibers or so over and over again. Those are the common calibers uh, with, within street crime in your area. And so those ones you're going to get to know quite well just through exposure. So it's important to understand that there are very deliberate dimensions uh, to the components of a cartridge there. The bullet components, the cartridge case components, individually as well as when they're assembled together, the overall dimensions of these are very deliberate, very specific. And one example of that are the three 9mm that we saw previously, 9x17, also 380 auto, 9 8 by 18 also 9 Makarov, 9 by 19 also 9 Parabellum. Uh, each one of these guys, even though they're all 9mm across in their diameter, their overall shape is quite different. And when you have nine millimeter Makarov, you don't want to have this bullet on top of it. It is going to take this bullet with these dimensions. Um, that also holds true for some other ones here. Uh, 7.62 by 25, 7.62 by 39, 7.62 by 54R. They all have a similar sounding bullet, but the bullet shape is quite different for each one and the short range bullet that's used in pistols or submachine guns didn't have to have an extreme range to it and so it's it's aerodynamic enough for short range but not for reaching out very very far 760 by 39 is a mid-range caliber 760 by 54 r is a longer range caliber and you see the bullets can be a bit longer a bit heavier and even inside here if you can see it it's going to be a bit more aerodynamic as well so just because they start with the same name does not mean the parts are interchangeable. There's going to be something very deliberate about each one of these uh, calibers. Shot shells are a little different. Uh, the main body here in red uh, would be plastic as far as this drawing goes. Uh, that is your case. At the bottom, you've got the metallic portion, which is the base. You could have some where the case itself is metallic as well. The, the metal base might extend all the way up. Uh, that case may sometimes even be cardboard too, depending on uh, how old the cartridge is or, or what brand it is. There's your rim at the bottom. Once we look inside, you can see at the very top, you've got the crimp here where the plastic was folded over to contain the, the payload inside. And that payload in this case is called shot. These are little pellets, usually lead or steel. And the shot itself can vary greatly depending on what it is that you are wanting to shoot at. Uh, so you have bird shot and buck shot. Bird shot for bird hunting, buck shot for deer hunting. And when you have that, the shot is, is also graded by numbers, which indicate the size to it. And depending on what range you expect to be firing at or the size of the bird or, or, uh, or deer, you can have uh, number four sh bird shot, number eight bird shot, which would have different size pellets, good for different ranges, and uh, buckshot as well, uh, double lot buckshot, triple lot buckshot. The bigger the pellets are, the fewer there are, but the more uh, more power they're going to have as they fly down range. The lighter, smaller ones are going to lose their energy sooner, but depending on how far away the target is, that's maybe not a concern. And when you do hit the bird that you're trying to hunt, uh, you don't want it to get pulverized. You're ideally trying to hunt this for, for its meat, and uh, using the right shot is going to give you the best results for that. Uh, what's great about shotguns is their versatility. From that same single shotgun, you can change up what you do by changing the actual round that you work with. And so you can hunt uh, birds in the morning and, and beat deer in the afternoon, and all you have to do is change the round in your barrel. The wad is the cup that is containing the shot and propellant that sits underneath it. You've got a base wad here, which is uh, at, the, at the bottom and between the base wad and the base is pinching the actual case. The primer is at the rear for center fire, like you see, and the primer is in something called the battery cup for shot shells, which is a unit that's assembled and then inserted into the base itself. 
An important note for shotguns is that wad, that plastic wad, is a buffer between the shot and the barrel. And the shot itself, you could even have one giant, uh, one giant projectile, in which case it would be called a slug for shotguns. And even when it's a slug that you're firing, there is always a wad, and that wad is always a buffer between the projectile and the barrel. So as far as bullet tracks goes, there's not much for uh, the bullet track system to work with here. However, with brass tracks, the cartridge case portion, everything that we're interested in is still happening on these shot shells. There's no reason you can't do a shot shell in brass tracks. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned to the channel for future content, and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.